the natural character and the seasonal patterns along Lake Michigan are a big part of what give our region its distinctive appeal and strong sense of place. Beautiful beaches, abundant native spring wildflowers, hemlocks and pines tucked into cool, back dune forests. It's all part of the magic of the Great Lakes shoreline. But as caretakers of these natural areas, we have to keep a close eye on these habitats and are all too familiar with the growing number of threats they face. From beech bark disease to hemlock woolly adelgid, new invasive forest pests threaten the trees within these habitats, while invasive plants lie in wait, ready to spread in the wake of their demise. On top of threats from these invasive species, the reliable weather patterns that have always set the stage for our native habitats seem to be changing right before our eyes. Record-setting high temperatures, extreme spring rain events, and unprecedented water levels in Lake Michigan all seem to be echoing predictions that scientists have made about a changing climate in the Midwest. The local impacts that we've seen would primarily be large storm events bringing lots of rain uh, that could lead to could lead to local flooding, uh, which may impact local communities and some of our natural communities as well. So we're just finding that the old infrastructure really isn't designed for these intense spring rain events that we're getting increasingly. Um, our red pines are more of a northern species and um, are not able to um, be able to be competitive in those warmer, drier summers that we've been experiencing. And if these chaotic patterns are the new norm, we have to ask ourselves. Isn't there something we can do for our Lake Michigan natural areas other than watch closely and hope for the best? We knew we needed to do something. But figuring out what to do and where to get started was hard. It seems like such a big problem that no individual person can make a difference. And so I think a lot of people get a little apathetic about it. But and I would say we really got stuck in that kind of analysis paralysis uh, syndrome and found it difficult to kind of take our first step forward. Then, in 2020, we heard about the Climate Adaptation Fund grant. So for us, the Climate Adaptation Fund was the first grant source that we had actually seen that was explicitly dedicated to thinking about adapting to climate change and funding those projects. And so for us, it really forced us to sit down and think critically about what we were doing and how we needed to do it differently. Thinking about our beloved nature preserves in 10, 50, and even 100 years um, led us to tweak a few things and do things differently. You know, led us to further realize that as humans we've had really negative impacts on the landscape, but we wanted to start righting those wrongs and really be thinking in the long view for these places. With the catalyst of this grant from the Climate Adaptation Fund, we convened a group of talented partners spanning a north to south geographic range of almost 150 miles along the Lake Michigan shoreline to brainstorm what individual and collective action we could take to make our region more resilient in the face of climate change. Each of these organizations had properties that were nestled right next to Lake Michigan amongst a wealth of other conservation lands that all experience a more mild climate due to this massive body of water. Together, we decided that we could take action by focusing on an easy to see and universally valued part of the natural landscape, trees. partnership that developed ended up spanning this north to south uh, latitude that ended up sitting right on what's called the ecological tension zone. And this is where historically during the last naturally occurring climate change after glaciers melted more than 10,000 years ago, this is where northern and southern communities um, kind of migrated and stopped. And so we started thinking that maybe these species would be facing 
migration challenges today, and that might be something that we could help with. We decided to try an approach called assisted tree migration. We thought, if assisted tree migration is going to work anywhere, it's going to be here. And if we found success here, maybe we could translate that success to other parts of our region and beyond. While trees have naturally made slow journeys across the landscape when climate has changed in the past, they can't do it quickly enough to keep up with this changing climate and landscape. Today, cities and suburbs, vast expanses of farmland, and invasive plants all act as significant barriers to trees' ability to migrate naturally to more suitable habitats. Residents and visitors to Michigan who drive from south to north will recognize a natural transition in tree species, trading oaks and hickories in the southern lower peninsula for pines, hemlocks, and paper birches as they travel north. This transition represents a visible path of tree migration that reflects the last naturally occurring climate change and where it ended thousands of years ago. Working plant species and genotypes from nearby southern areas into habitat restoration projects is part of this assisted tree migration approach. It prepares our forests for milder winters and warmer summers brought on by climate change and gives them a little human help to get past the human-made barriers so they can more quickly make the long migrations that they have naturally made in the past. Trees are the bedrock of many of our Lake Michigan natural areas. By ensuring that there will always be a canopy over our heads that provides us with shade, keeps forests cool, and shelters wildlife, we can hopefully provide some much needed stability and resiliency in our landscape in these rapidly changing times. And luckily, our friends in the U.S. Forest Service have been regularly tracking changes in our forests and trees for over 90 years. By tracking which tree species grow in what conditions and projecting how these growing conditions will be affected by climate change, forestry scientists have predicted the location of suitable habitat for all kinds of tree species in the coming decades. In addition to planting tree and shrub species and genotypes that have historically been considered more southern, the partners removed dead and dying trees to help remove the opportunity for damaging pests. They thinned overly dense tree canopies to allow smaller, more diverse trees to fill in the forest floor. And they chipped the trees they had removed into mulch to help protect the newly planted trees from drought, which has become pretty common over the last several years. I would say diversity is key. Uh, we just, there's, there's all kinds of research going on about how climate change has impacted things thus far. There's modeling going on trying to predict what will happen in the future, but in reality we just simply don't know exactly what's going to happen, what the future conditions are going to be like. And so when it comes to seed mixes, um, tree plantings, habitat protection, diversity is key. Uh, the more diverse things are, the more likely they are to thrive under future conditions, uh, and the more resilient that habitat will be when disturbances do come. Over two years, the five partners restored 427 acres of habitat at 12 natural areas spanning 100 miles of Lake Michigan shoreline and planted 15,670 individual trees and shrubs of 57 different species. Together, their work has helped to ensure that the natural character that defines the eastern Lake Michigan shoreline and our region as a whole will be more resilient in the face of climate change and continue to provide a beautiful backdrop for the lives of many people for generations to come. In the end, the partners all had different but similar reasons for wanting to be part of the project. One, um, we learn from each other. We learn not only from our successes but also from our failures. So being able to um, grow as an organization is important, but it's also growing as a landscape level, as a community, and as a, as a region as well. So being able to collaborate um, was able to give us the chance to also share ideas and make our project even better than it would have been if we just did it by ourselves. It's just the diversity of ideas and perspectives that you can gain from working with uh, folks from other organizations. Um, we thought it was a good opportunity to collaborate, we, uh, so it was really helpful to get some reassurance, to get some other opinions and some other options for uh, adaptation planning. 
we spent less time thinking about the current conditions and what would thrive in these conditions and spent more time thinking about 50 to 100 years from now and what would perform well under those anticipated conditions. And I don't think we would have done that without this project. You no, know, I think we all want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And I think especially in the face of COVID and all these other challenges, you know, people want to make a difference and, you know, it just helps you feel good. Like, hey, I'm making a difference for, you know, the places that these plants and animals live. What advice would you give to someone who doesn't know what to do about climate change? Um, or to do small steps. Even small steps are helping us move forward. Plant. Baby steps. And we, we need to remember to adapt to the things that we're seeing in real time as well. My advice would be to take a step. Even if it's a very small step, just take a step forward. Because climate change can be such an overwhelming, complex, and daunting thought and impact that a lot of times it leads us to just kind of shut down and not do anything. But it's amazing what taking a small step can have as far as positive feelings. We sort of associate climate change with a lot of negative uh, feelings and emotions, but it's amazing what taking a small step can do for that morale and kind of make you feel empowered and give you momentum to move forward. And that's even better if we can combine it with the actions of others and kind of feel that we're in it together. Many thanks to the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation who supported the Climate Adaptation Fund grant. A huge thank you to our partners, Chickaming Open Lands, Ottawa County Parks, Shirley Hines Land Trust, and the Nature Conservancy in Michigan and our eternal gratitude to all of the members, donors, and volunteers at Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy who help us every day to conserve these amazing landscapes for today and keep them healthy for tomorrow. <laughs>